Today's video is going to be really fun. We're doing a video about the worst mistakes we've seen in pre-built so far. Some of them are comically bad, to the point where you're crying at the end of it, because of the state the world's in, because they ship things like this. Wow, that's crazy. And also sometimes they ship this. There's your uh, chassis I.O. built into the motherboard. But either way, our goal today is to recap some of the worst mistakes we've seen in the last year from pre built and just in general. Hopefully this will help some of you with figuring out what things to look for as you buy a pre built or recommend them for friends and family. And maybe if you're new to this stuff, it'll help you learn how to fix the problems on your own and troubleshoot them. Or you can just watch this for entertainment because uh, it's, Either it's either depressing or extremely funny how bad some of the mistakes have been. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. All right, so the goal of this content, again, is to help with a few things. On the useful side, you'll learn about how to identify problems, hopefully, before ordering the system. And once you get it, how to maybe fix some of those most common issues with pre-built. On the, the not helpful side, you get to see a recap of some of our recent pre-built reviews where we've looked at Dell, HP, Alienware, uh, ABS, which is a Newegg brand. We have other ones coming in we can't name because we don't want them to know that we've bought their systems and some of them have already failed the test before they've even shipped the box because they don't know we bought it. Uh, and then we've looked at SkyTech and Lenovo's Legion, a couple of other things. As a reminder, as we roll into this, we have purchased all of these pre-built we've looked at recently with our own money. Thank you to all of you who've helped us do that by buying things from the store at store.gamersnexus.net where you can pick up your own wireframe desk-sized mouse mat, blue and black in design with PC components and high detail on it. You can also grab one of our large mod mats. They have just come back in stock. They're shipping out now, so if you place a back order, it'll ship in the next week or so. If you want to grab one of the GN Vault mod mats, which is a PC building surface for maintaining your computer, protecting your table and the parts on it, and also providing quick reference materials. And then of course we have our shirts, like the out of stock shirts in tri-blend and comfortable cotton. Pick up anything like that on store.cameraxis.net to help us out with buying more pre built So we get to talk about bloatware, proprietary parts, getting screwed, as in the, the screws are rattling around in the case when you pick it up, uh, and plenty of other problems like power supplies and coolers and cases and there's a lot of problems with pre -builds. Let's get started. Proprietary parts are next on the list. Proprietary parts use the guise of performance or size to mask the fact that it's actually just planned obsolescence of components to force repurchases rather than repairs. There is an upside though. Proprietary parts will benefit us in our not too distant dystopian future when humanity desperately harvests metal from landfills left behind by our ancestors. Dell and HP, for example, are actually helping the planet. They're guaranteeing that someone is throwing away an OEM computer with every passing second. So these companies ensure that their shit is perpetually at the top of the landfill, thereby making it easier for our successors to find steel out of which they can forge their spears. We never said GN staff was optimistic. When Dell and HP swiped right on each other, it was because they both listed lawn walks on the beach as a secondary joy to stuffing homes and landfills alike full of what could be useful gold, copper, fiberglass, steel, and aluminum. Fortunately, system integrators have mostly moved to standardized, reusable, and easily serviceable or replaceable parts. But OEMs remain entrenched in ways where a motherboard's form factor is defined as fuck you, and the cost to replace it is a new computer. Take a look at these motherboards. Common motherboard form factors are 12 by 9.6 inches, 9.6 by 9.6 inches, 6.7 by 6.7 inches, or maybe you get into SSI, CEB, or EEB sizes, both of which are well-defined. These two motherboards, however, one from Dell and one from HP, are none of those sizes. They're who knows inches wide by who cares inches long because the customer is going to pay for a new one anyway and that benefits us. Dell and HP want to be able to use cases they designed 25 years ago. And that's not much of an exaggeration. So instead of installing separate I.O. for the front, they build it into the motherboard. 
The only advantage of any of this is that it's cheap to make. But none of it is good. It's trash tier components. Instead of buy once, cry once, they're following the alternative motto of buy lots of times to keep the earnings reports good. That's before even talking about proprietary coolers or power supplies. The coolers are about the worst thing to make non-standard because a cooler is just a brick of copper and aluminum with the fan. There's nothing in it that goes bad. It doesn't have an expiration date. And as long as mounting is adapted forward, there's also no reason an ancient cooler can't be used on new parts as long as it was designed well to begin with. Some coolers we've seen actually screw into the chassis instead of a back blade, which is unusable outside of the specific case motherboard and CPU combo that ships with it. And as for power supplies, we'll talk about that more later. Bloatware has a superpower. It can freeze time, as in like it can freeze your system. And also it has the ability to turn a brand new 2021 system into a time capsule of Windows ME coupled with hapless LimeWire and Kazaa downloading, acting as an anthropological fossil of a desperate time. Here you go. I clicked on uh, System Health, and the first thing it came up with was, what is malware? And I feel like it should just be a picture of this application. Bloatware is easily one of the most egregious offenses on pre-built and on laptops alike. It's been going on for decades now, so it's not new, but it's still happening. System builders often partner with bloatware providers. I think they call this software, but we're not really sure if it qualifies for that definition. Norton, for example, would be a common one or McAfee, or whatever this control panel is. The OEMs and the SIs can get MDF, or Marketing Development Fund, or affiliate fees, or some form of cut to increase the install base. They then figure that since they are burdening a new NVMe SSD to the point of simulating Seagate's best effort anyway, they might as well fully commit and load it with various warranty registration pop-ups, support desk pop-ups, presumably so you can get support to remove the support desk pop-up, command centers whose command is solely over your CPU cycles, and antivirus software that presumably doesn't work since it doesn't kill any of this other malware anyway. This included software doesn't just make the system obnoxious to use, it's how it can profoundly negatively impact the system performance as well, especially in a latency sensitive application like video games. We've run numerous bloatware tests in the past showing that real world scenarios of bloat, like on the Dell G5 5000, can produce significantly worse gaming results than when the system is cleaned up after the fact. HP also was offensive in its bloatware. In fact, the constant background services were so bad that the run-to-run -run variants in our CPU and very memory-bound Hitman 3 benchmark resulted in us assigning the HP Legion a did not finish score. Many years in the past, we even reviewed an MSI laptop specifically for its bloatware showing how much it impacted the 0.1% lows and frame-to-frame -frame consistency of games. In this regard, bloatware's sort of like Pokemon. You've got to catch them all. And our recent Alienware system review certainly showed Alienware's attempt at collecting them all. At least it's, it's probably Pokemon. It could be like diseases too. It's the same idea. Many of the smaller system integrators don't do this. And that's fantastic. That's their main advantage even if they're a little more expensive than an OEM like Dell or HP or Lenovo. These three are the guiltiest. For novices, these applications make the entire experience worse than it should be, likely resulting in a lot of the initial swell of Apple users over the past two decades. For experts, it's still difficult to remove a lot of this stuff because it behaves like a rootkit. It's stealthy, it hides in the background, and it buries itself in services. So a lot of times it's easier to just do a clean install. The next one is for RAM, just in general. Everyone screws this one up in some capacity. CyberPower, iBuyPower, Dell, Alienware, Lenovo, pretty much any system we've brought through the lab at some point has messed up on the memory. It's always RAM. Although not every channel needs to be populated in a multi-channel platform, at least using two channels is ideal. And just to be clear, there's no such thing as dual channel mode or dual channel RAM sticks. It's just how many channels the platform has. Sometimes OEMs will basically lie and say they're selling you quote unquote dual channel RAM, except it's one stick going into a board that can support two channels. So it's not actually two channels. It's just a really clever way to sort of make it sound like it is. We've also seen companies use cheap modules with fewer memory packages on the PCB, resulting in potentially worse performance depending on what the memory is. Look at how lonely these memory modules are. They have no friends. Or just memory with horrific timings instead, like CL22 on 2933 memory. 
We see this pop up in games like Rainbow Six Siege, where a system with otherwise good performance will absolutely balk in the frame time consistency as a result of poor memory configurations. Oftentimes, it's not even more expensive to do this right. They can just add another stick and run half the capacity per stick while getting potentially more performance. This is common among every manufacturer we've looked at. Even though ABS's Challenger we bought had two sticks of RAM, not every model from the Newegg owned house brand does. As a consumer, you need to keep an eye out for particularly bad memory. For whatever reason, this seems to be the component where they'll avoid giving you any specs beyond the stick count and maybe the capacity. So you're out of luck for timings in most instances, but a lot can be gauged from appearance as well. Assuming they even show you what it looks like in the photos. We also commonly see manufacturers push way too much capacity for an otherwise underpowered system. This ends up just being a waste of money. If you're buying a strictly gaming PC and they're pushing 32 gigabytes of garbage RAM on you, just know that the difference between 16 gigabytes and 32 will almost never be noticed in daily use for something like gaming or web browsing unless you have a really bad tabs habit outside of more production focused applications. But the difference in cost towards a better GPU, CPU, or just actually having more money to be less stressed, that will be noticed. The extra RAM probably won't be unless you know you need it. Extra memory can definitely be better. It's certainly better because it lets you be lazier with how you manage your applications in the background. It's also better for something like Adobe Photoshop or Premiere to some extent. But if you still have a low end i5 in there at the end of the day, there's a limit to how much that RAM will help before you're just stuck somewhere else anyway. Of course, there's no reason to limit getting screwed to just these parts. You can also get screwed by the literal screws in the computers. We've been to screw factories in the past, some of which even advertise a screw class. Try your worst, commenters. But we've never been screwed quite like how OEMs do it. Partly due to shipping and partly due to, well, let's be honest, largely due to QC shortcomings, we've had systems with screws so over torqued that they've bent steel panels and cases. They've scratched off paint on the side panel, and they've applied an unsettling amount of force to socketed CPUs with fragile pins. Way unnecessary amount of force. Way, way, way too much. You We've also had the opposite, where some systems have had screws loose enough that they ended up rolling around the case instead, if they were ever even threaded to begin with. Well, oh, that sounds good. So that hole, that's supposed to have a screw in it. The motherboard's not even in. Or motherboard screws that were nearly falling out of the threads and could be spun back in just by tapping on them. A normal part of setting up your new pre-built, it seems, should be to pick it up and shake it around a little bit to see if anything rattles loose. Coolers are the next common corner to cut. We already talked about this a little bit, but we saw this especially with the CyberPower build we reviewed recently. The build was otherwise actually pretty good, and that's the depressing part about it. At least it was better than some of its competitors we reviewed. What the f <laughs> Okay, I spoke a little soon. It's just like the Molex centipede or... But it failed our review because it was thermal throttling. It was actually hitting 100 degrees Celsius, which is unacceptable. Literally, they had one job, and it was to build a functioning computer. The build is completely salvageable with a cooler replacement, even something like a, to the consumer, $30 Vetri V5 or similar, but the fact that the OEM didn't even bother is the part that's offensive. The Alienware R10 we reviewed, despite having water cooling suggestions on its box, actually just had a cooler that's worse than an Intel stock cooler. And that was on an AMD R750 800 CPU. So once again, we see an example of a CPU which is woefully undercooled compared to the rest of the basically $2,000 computer. You could literally buy a better cooler for about $7 on AliExpress than what was in the Alienware $2,000 R10 we reviewed. That's not exaggeration. It's also common for pre-builds to include 120 millimeter AIO liquid coolers in their system, presumably because the words liquid cooler means this is good or something to consumers who think that water is magic. Especially though, Ira Power and NZXT's BLD series with, for example, the M22 in the past, like to use these small liquid coolers. 120 mil liquid coolers, in a word, are bad. We've tested a lot of them over the years and we basically stopped testing them because the conclusion was always that they're bad. They're a waste of money when compared to a cheap air cooler. 120 millimeter AIOs make sense for some GPUs, 
and for many ITX or SFF PCs that just strictly can't fit better. But in an ATX build or a mid tower or micro ATX, it should either be a larger liquid cooler or a small tower cooler. The reason OEMs do this though is because they can get them for cheap with a pump plate that has their logo on it and then it sounds good in the marketing. Of course, we can't leave power supplies out. We've had shockingly good results in some cases, like the Dell G5 5000 power supply being actually really good in some ways. And then we've also just had straight up shocking results. Oh, fuck. <laughs> We've seen a lot of pre-builds include bad power supplies. And to the great credit of OEMs, it does seem like a lot of them have learned and have taken parts from their server business and repurposed them. They're not flashy, they're actually kind of annoying to work with, but in our testing thus far, they've been reliable. Meanwhile, system integrators use whatever, because who cares, it's a power supply and the only thing they put on it is how many watts. Sometimes that means Newegg starts cramming gigabyte exploiting power supplies into ABS pre-builds and NZXT Build has done the same for some of its pre-builds in, for example, Germany, when we were looking at their options there. We've also discovered power supplies that are just horrifically inefficient, like the Raid Max one in one of our pre-builds we reviewed, and could be significantly better at minimal cost to either the user or the manufacturer. Pre-built manufacturers also often over-spec the PSUs, but not in a helpful or good way. Budget gets spent on high capacity or high wattage because saying 800 watts somehow makes you better than the company that says 500 watts, even though they're actually supplying the same components with power. This is as opposed to spending the money as the manufacturer on actually useful features like protections and efficiency while sticking closer to the needed amount of power. And all this is without even talking about the weird, once again, proprietary parts where it's not quite a TFX power supply, it's definitely not an ATX power supply, and it's not technically 12VO because it doesn't have a 10-pin motherboard header. No, these are special power supplies that, again, large OEMs like to use, where the power supply might otherwise be fine and pass all of its protections, but can't be used in anything else ever because that would be bad, then you wouldn't need to buy another one. So that'll be it for the most obvious and egregious mistakes we've seen recently. There's a lot more. Of course, we had the one issue where the iBuy power system shipped and the video card had basically ripped the socket partly out of the motherboard. That was pretty cool. Uh, there was also the time that Walmart filled the USB 3.0 header with hot glue. That was also a really unique and innovative tool for building a computer. It didn't happen this year though, so we left it out. Uh, and there's plenty more we can talk about. If there's something either we've looked at or you've found on your own in a pre-built, please feel free to leave it in the comments below. We can't possibly fit all the mistakes in the video, but it, this one's got the most common ones. Hopefully this provides some educational value for what you can look out for, how to fix the problems. Uh, as you learn more about PCs, even if you are not building them yourself yet, it's shockingly easy to immediately improve a system from an OEM especially by just going through a few of these things on our list and trying to address that one issue at a time, like the bloatware, for example. And if you're an expert, then it's still helpful because it gives you something to point at and say, I build computers better than that billion dollar company. That's about the best, that's the most positive angle we have for it. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more like this. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out buying more pre-builds and just to get something quality in return that you can use. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind the scenes videos and some extras. And check out our new pre-built PC review playlist. We'll link it below in case you want to see some of these systems in action, maybe find some of the better ones. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.